I was reviewing AMC data on med school admissions and was struck by the fact that Loyola Chicago's Stritch School of Medicine in the 2017-18 application cycle received more applications, 15,015 to be exact, than any other medical school in the AMC. What is the secret to its popularity? Let's find out in this interview with its head of admissions. Welcome to the 325th episode of Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this po podcast. My mission and passion is to help you show that you both fit in at your target schools and are a standout in the applicant pool. The result, you get a message one day that causes you to jump up and down shouting, yes, I'm in, and not only in, but in the best program for you. Now, before we meet our guest today, I'd like to invite you to our next webinar, How to Nail Your Medical School Interviews, to be presented by Sydney Foote, who has been advising accepted clients to medical school since 2001. She gives concrete, well-organized advice for before, during, and after your traditional med school admissions interviews. Don't miss it. Register today at accepted.com slash 325 webinar. Our guest today is Daryl Neighbors, Assistant Dean for Admissions and Recruitment at Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. Daryl earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Whittier College and Golden Gate University, respectively. He then held various admissions positions from 2000 to 2005 before joining the University of Chicago's admissions staff. There he served in different roles until 2015. He joined Loyola Chicago Stritch in 2015 as Director of Admissions and became Assistant Dean for Admissions and Recruitment in February 2019. Daryl, welcome to Admissions Straight Talk. Thank you for having me, Linda. My pleasure. Now, let's start the very beginning. What is distinctive, or if you can give an overview focusing on what is distinctive, about the Stritch School of Medicine's approach to medical education? Well, I believe that uh, a Jesuit education is pretty rare. There are four Jesuit medical schools in the country, um, and we are um, the only one in Chicago. There are five allopathic medical schools in Chicago. There's another osteopathic school. Um, so having been at another institution in Chicago, another medical school, I could say that the distinction that I drew from my earlier experience when I thought of Loyola was that um, it was very service oriented. Uh, they were um, actively promoting service related events. They were um, advocating for, for DACA students when no other medical school in the city was, was uh, recruiting them or, or admitting them. Um, so um, I, I found that that was a, a very unique thing about them. And when I came here, um, it became clear that their students are positive and compassionate people, um, that they are receptive to uh, the insights of people from a lot of different backgrounds and experiences. They actively seek out those types of interactions. So they have uh, global networks where they conduct service each year. Uh, they're actively serving within their uh, catchment area. Uh, they have a relationship with the Maywood community. Um, again, when I look at the students uh, specifically, I see that the students here possess a rather effective sense of inquiry and uh, love of learning, which is not, uh, it's, it's not certainly a, a quality that's lacking in medical school students. I think all medical school, school students are, are equally uh, inquisitive. But the thing that I noticed about Stritch is that the students take that inquisition and they kind of look at society in a very different way and actively seek to improve society by providing care, assistance, and empathy, um, particularly for those who are on the margins of society. And I think a lot of that has to do with the ministry influence here. I think it has a lot to do with the bioethics influence that does have uh, some grounding and foundation in the coursework. Um, and so you can kind of look at other areas of the enterprise here, the global health programs and the MPH program, but uh, certainly I think those are the qualities that sort of distinguish it. How, how would the bioethics or the, or the spiritual dimension, spiritual dimension 
show up in the in the classroom or the coursework? I mean, is it something that students opt into, or is it integrated into the coursework? It's more integrated. I mean, there's there's twofold approach. I mean, you could opt into an honors track in bioethics or an mm -hmm. honors track in global health. Um, if you did that, you would be focusing um, your perspective on coursework that is uh, elective based and it's aligned with, um, for example, if you're in a bioethics honors track, uh, you become a member of the bioethics team. They obviously field inqu inquiries from uh, medical staff here on our campus uh, who may have issues related to patient interactions and want some um, some feedback, some advice, some counsel, uh, and being a part of that team as one part of the experience of being on the honors track. You obviously develop a project um, that is referencing the effectiveness of uh, ethical care um, or perspectives on ethical care, and again, largely within the, the purview of a marginalized community. Um, within the realm of the ministry effort, uh, you have something here called the Physician's Vocation Program, which is an immersive uh, four-year track that is, again, an elective, but it's an elective that uh, covers each of the years. Each year, you have a different set of goals where you're achieving an understanding of the examinum, which is uh, the Ignatian spiritual dynamism that goes into you know his purview of all things but you're focusing that examining on medicine and medical care so taking that perspective which is largely something that would be part of the jesuit culture um, as if you're a priest you would obviously be very involved in this process uh, moving towards your uh your goals within the, the church and obviously within the goals of acquiring your, your divinity degree, but here it is applied in the realm of medicine. So each year you're able to sort of look at these different goals in terms of spiritual and personal growth and applying them within your trade. So ultimately uh, the goal is to kind of meld the elements of what would make a person uh, a spiritual guide or a spiritual uh, mentor uh, and kind of you know kind of intertwining that into the the role of becoming a physician so that's obviously very unique but for but then those are opt-in options uh, but for the standard curriculum um, within the first three years we have patient-centered medicine which is a course that starts with um, sort of looking at the patient care perspective from a big macro level and then ultimately focusing on the micro level in terms of your ability to care for patients and in that big picture perspective you do have a lot of kind of coverage of society and systems and obviously within the society structure that we see we obviously kind of examine power and how power is placed within society and these different um, social constructs that allow us to understand more effectively how our patients are influenced by the communities that they live in. So when they become patients here, uh, we have an understanding of what their experiences are and who uh, and what parts of our culture they represent. So we are able to more effectively uh, care for them as patients. So that's by and large how that's folded into the standard curriculum. But again, uh, you can opt into more immersive tracks uh, in either area if you if you desire to do so. Okay. Now, um, Loyola Stritch received 15,015 applications according to AMC last year. And I have two questions related to that number. One is, that is the most applications I received, I think that was received by any US medical school last oh, yeah. year. And so the question becomes, to what do you attribute that success in attracting those many applications? And how do you whittle it down to 165 students? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've, I've always been asked 
this question, you know, the, we actually consider uh, last year to be uh, really kind of two cycles ago, and we actually haven't really closed out this cycle completely yet. No, so right. uh, the 2019 cycle, we had 14,905 applications. The 2018 cycle, as you mentioned, 15,000. Uh, 15 or 15,016 applications. Um, so when I started here in 2015, um, we had a pretty decent recruiting strategy, but I think what we tried to do was we tried to expand our recruitment to first of all, cover all of the Jesuit programs, all the Jesuit undergraduate programs in the country on a four year basis. Mm -hmm. So every four, every fourth year, um, we are going to a different uh, grouping of Jesuit undergraduate schools. That's plan one. Plan two was to uh, understand that when we look at our applicant pool, we are largely attracting students from out of state. So to find those students um, and to look for heavy populations of students who are in this age range of our, uh, of our applicant pool, you know, we focus on the West Coast, we focus on the Southeast, we focus on the Northeast. Um, the largest number of medical school students by population come from California. Um, and California obviously is a very populated state, 40 million people, one out of every, um, I believe one out of every uh, four, I think that's the number, uh, people west of the Mississippi lives in uh, California. So. Uh, when you consider the population dynamics and the age of those individuals and the dearth of medical school programs on the West Coast, we become an automatic destination for anyone who lives in California who says, okay, I'm going to cover California completely for all the different medical schools, starting with the UC system, and then maybe going to the osteopathic realm, but they're not enough schools to capture all the students that want to go to medical school there. So then they start heading east. Uh, I know UNLV just opened a medical school, um, but you know Colorado has maybe one or two. But again, mm -hmm. when you're talking about those state programs, they tend to attract students within that state. state. So the next largest metropolitan area is really Chicago. When I was at the University of Chicago, we, we had the same dynamic. We had more candidates in our pool from California than any other state. So really trying to focus on that population, you know, so again, recruiting territories are divided up among our staff. So I focus a lot on the West Coast. Um, we have a, a great number of students coming from California. There are a great number of Jesuit school programs in California, Santa Clara, mm -hmm. University of San Francisco, Loyola Marymount. Right. So they've done a very good job of, of being able to be present and aware uh, to those communities, to those students. Uh, we counsel and advise as a staff. Uh, that's one thing that we do in our admissions team. And that's pretty much how I um, develop my understanding of medical school admissions is working um, at the University of Chicago for a team of admissions staff that were guided by um, Sylvia Robertson, who was my first admissions uh, dean and Herb Abelson. Uh, who had a medical background. Uh, Sylvia had an advising background. And uh, I have a teaching background. So it just made sense to, you know, kind of utilize that approach. So, you know, we can talk to students who are interested in medical school, but we can also advise them and help them understand, you know, like we're going to try to help you have a, a good application regardless of where you apply. I think that approach engenders trust and I think that ultimately that's one of the reasons why we're able to have so many um, students interested in our program. But I also think that we try to utilize the mechanisms that the AAMC provides. One thing that they provide is a registry. Um, so when a student takes the, uh, the MCAT, they have a chance to um, opt into a registry list that provides their name, their information, basic information. Um, and their MCAT score to any school that wishes to receive it. Um, and that is called the, uh, the, the MedMAR. So we've actually utilized the MedMAR registry as well, uh, <clears throat> which is sort of a, an attempt, if you were gonna, gonna consider anything akin to cold calling, that'd be the closest thing to it, where you're reaching out to someone that may have never heard of you before, 
and um, letting them know that, you know, they could in fact apply to our medical school and uh, be given, you know, a holistic review. And so encouraging holistic review is another way to increase your numbers because you're basically saying to the population at large, we're not going to cut off any consideration based on your, your GPA or your MCAT, uh, we're going to give everyone the same equal uh, treatment in terms of looking at your application. Obviously, when you have that large number and we start to narrow it down, going through that funnel requires completion of the supplemental application. So intentionally, ours is a little bit um, more dense than a lot of schools. And surprisingly enough, uh, that 15,000 will narrow to about 10,000 once students decide, hey, I may or may not decide to fill out this 10 question supplemental. I, I may not want to invest that kind of time. So, so the number 15,000 is ultimately when it comes to reviewing applications about 10,500. So the 15,000 15, 15, are those who, let's say, check your box on, on the MCAS, right? On the primary. Right, on the primary, right, exactly. And so everyone, uh, as long as you are a US citizen, a permanent resident or a DACA recipient, you will receive the supplemental application. Uh, it requires some, some thought and some time to complete. Um, obviously, I think um, a lot of school, a lot of students will look at us initially because, you know, when they look at the MSAR, which is the medical school admissions requirements, they're gonna see the schools that, that meet, you know, a, a number of academic criteria, a range of scores for their, for their students. They're gonna look at the location. Obviously being the third largest city in the United States helps us out immensely. Uh, they're gonna look at the patient population. They're gonna look at the very, uh, the varied clinical affiliations that may exist. You know, we have a VA hospital right here on our campus. Uh, we're in a large, uh, diverse urban environment. We have the ability to put our students into rural uh, clinical environments, downstate in Illinois or in Indiana. So there's a lot of different types of students that we can attract because we have a lot of different um, and interesting affiliations that might attract them. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you complete the supplemental application, uh, you go through a pretty rigorous review. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have an excellent staff of faculty and students who participate in this process. We train them and they're able to take an application and holistically review it. Um, we have two students, uh, one student, one faculty, or one staff and one faculty, or two faculty reviewing each application that's submitted. And by virtue of an internal scoring mechanism, we can take anyone that meets a certain threshold and consider them for interview. So our capacity for interviewing uh, through each cycle is about 700 candidates. So we're gonna take that 10,500 and we're going to uh, whittle it down to 700. So to get to that point, um, it takes again, a great review process. Um, I, that's one of the reasons why I always encourage students to apply early because we start this process in July and our, our review committee is actively uh, reviewing these candidates. Uh, we start interviews in early, uh, well, actually in late August. Um, so if you're early in the process, knowing that there's such a long line of students in front of you, it does benefit you because we are looking for candidates to interview. Um, I sent out our first batch of interview invites today. Um, so, okay. you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where uh, fortune favors the early mover. And, um, you know, if you are um, fortunate enough to get an interview here, uh, then that means that you're within uh, about the top 5% of our pool in terms of how we have right. holistically scored you in our process. Right. Now, a few questions, just, just for the, the listener's benefit. This interview is going to be posted on August 13th, but the, it's being recorded on August 1. So when Daryl says that he sent it out today, it's August 1, not the date that you're listening to it. So there, just to, to reiterate, there's no automatic screen on secondaries. The screen is basically the amount of effort that's required to submit one. 
Right, there is a screen. I mean, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say there was a screen. I mean, we do set up um, parameters within our system to okay. demarcate a student's file. And a lot of that is based on, first of all, is there an institutional action? Is there, is there anything that might need further scrutiny? So, you know, those files are set aside and reviewed. Uh, again, as I stated, you have to meet our citizenship criteria. We do not have the ability to process visas on our campus, although mm -hmm. you know we're part of Loyola University as a whole. Loyola University does have those resources on its main campus, but we're in Maywood. We're actually 20 minutes from our main campus, which is in Rogers Park, which is a little bit north of Chicago. We're on the west side of Chicago, uh, kind of close to the border of Cook and DuPage County. Uh, so our resources are largely affiliated with clinical staff, clinical resources. I mentioned our, our VA hospital, for example, but we don't have the uh, staffing or ability to process visas here. So that's why we eliminate those students from our pool. Um, and we also look at uh, certain components of the application to determine preference for, for review. So right. if you're in that higher preference for review, you have hit target marks that we can program into our system, uh, referencing your academic uh, criteria, your undergraduate GPA, your science GPA. Uh, we look at the last 25 credits of your academic program, because we do know that a lot of students will either be late to medicine or will want to do a post-bac program or may do a graduate program. So we want to give uh, our, our, our committee an understanding of how that, that trend may have improved. Uh, given that additional coursework. Uh, we look at the ratio of your science core compared to all of your other credits. And this is not to say that we don't, um, we don't uh, take in students who have a variety of different degrees. As a matter of fact, in our incoming class this year, there are over uh, 100 different types of undergraduate degrees coming into our program. Wow. But we have to know that you have enough science in your background to to handle the rigor of our curriculum and even if you didn't you would still be reviewed but you would be reviewed in a preference that is different um than uh or or maybe a, a preference that is um are you still there yes yeah yeah okay. I, mean, I just I, i'm sorry no, i just I'm lost you <laughs> no, I'm i lost your picture <laughs> okay all right um but um you know so if um if if you are, are kind of you know maybe a little bit rough around the edges you know you you will still be reviewed but it may be that we preference review for others first and then yeah. go after your application so again that's how we just have to to do it given the volume of our applications uh and um and you know the, the fact that we have uh our committee working um to review our files. So, and the other thing that was oh, are, very yeah. clear from what you said earlier, okay, glad, sure. uh, is that <laughs> um, is that you can, you're very open to out-of-state residents. You have no preference really in terms of in-state versus out-of-state. Right, we're a private institution. Um, so we, you know, we obviously, we have a very broad recruitment uh, platform. We do a lot of recruitment in-state uh, within the Midwest. Um, but again, like I said, you know, we, we are competing with five different allopathic programs. And interestingly enough, for most of them, uh, I'd say four out of those five, they also have the same dynamic of having more students apply to them from out of state. Uh, the one exception would be the, the University of Illinois Chicago, because they are a state school. Yeah, and yeah. they are incumbent to um, to provide that resource to in-state students first. So they typically do have the majority of in-state uh, in-state applicants. Sure, and they probably also have a tuition break for in-state applicants. Absolutely, yes. Right, right. Is there? Do you also consider um, non-U.S. residents? Again, they have to be permanent residents. Okay. So you know, um, when we yeah when we look at our incoming class now we have eighteen there uh, we have students who have uh, who were born in eighteen different countries um, 
but you know they have uh, a permanent residency permanent status residency. here, or they are DACA students, or they um, they are U.S. citizens. Got it. And let's turn to the application process, okay? Mm -hmm. What is it now? You you, you obviously have a, a rather demanding secondary application. But what is it that you're looking to get from the secondary application that you don't find in the primary, other than commitment to, to stretch? Um, well, within the secondary application, um, you know, we do have questions that are, you know, the primary is, is, is where it basically is a very general application. You have your personal statement, which is probably the most um, probably the most personalized, obviously, for part of that application. But even in writing a personal statement, it has to be has to be general, you know, it has to has to be able to encourage consideration from every school you're applying to uh, the supplemental or in some cases, as it's referred to the secondary application is really a way to further understand that candidates commitment or motivation to attend your specific school so what we are looking for is uh, thoughtful reflection about our mission uh, the questions are designed to understand that personal motivation towards our specific environment of care um, obviously you could have you know out of those 700 candidates you interview you could have 650 remarkable candidates who have completed the primary application in flawless manner and have great letters of recommendation. But at the end of the day, they could also have three, five, 10 other schools that they prefer. And ultimately, if you were to give, and as you mentioned, we have 165 as our enrollment goal. This year it was 170. But if you're looking for that specific group to matriculate, knowing that at the end of the day there might be other schools who desire them equally you know you want to be able to to say okay we know that these students that we're making our offers to are compelled to come here because they have told us specifically in some way shape or form that this is the right place for them and that's typically where we find that sort of connection is in the supplemental uh, or secondary application okay yeah, I, I sometimes I frequently say that the primary application is about fitness for, and this is obviously a 30,000 foot view of it, but the primary application is about fitness for medicine and uh, uh, the field and the secondary and interview are about your fitness for a particular program, fit with exactly. a particular program. Great. Absolutely, that's a great way of putting it. Now, what is the interview day like at Stritch? MMI, traditional, what's it like? Oh, definitely traditional. <clears throat> we okay. have uh, two structured interviews per candidate. Uh, we uh, look at the interview day as a full day of activities. Uh, we have students arriving about 8.30. We have an orientation, which is an hour long at nine o'clock. Uh, we do a little bit of an activity. One of the great things we do is we, we this activity actually uh, takes on some dimensions of qualifying why they were chosen so and it you know i i don't do the orientations anymore but you know for the first couple of years after it was developed it was remarkable to see how many students would fall right into the exact sort of construct that we expected in this exercise and you can see their faces whenever they complete it they're just like wow i must be in the right place you know, and it's blind polling that we use to determine some of the responses that we get. So it does, not only does it help us help them understand that they're in the right place, but it also helps us focus all of our sort of commentary and questions on things that are important for them to understand in each interview day. And obviously each interview group is different. We have either, we have anywhere between 12 to 18 candidates per interview day. Uh, we interviewed two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so, you know, every interview group is unique, but the thing that I that I marvel at is how um, how well they take to the day, the structure of the day, and and how how many of them remember 
so vividly their interview day here. Um, we put them in contact with a lot of our students. Um, we have students who interview. Uh, we train our students to interview. We train our faculty and staff to interview. So in the standard interview, uh, you have an opportunity to spend 45 minutes with a second or fourth year student or a faculty member. Uh, the questions are conversational. You know, we don't have any stress questions, not a stress interview. It's just a real opportunity to get to know the candidate. A lot of what's referenced in the interview are comments from our review committee members. So if we're going to review a candidate, we provide a structured review um, a mechanism for our reviewers that also allows them to provide commentary and questions to pose to the candidate for further reflection, because we have a different uh, committee meeting um, to discuss and to review uh, those applications once the interviews have completed. So the structured interviews, being that they are um, a part of a, of a larger process moving forward, we try intentionally not to make them exactly the same. So in that sense, what we do is we actually give one interviewer all the material from the file, including the letters of recommendation and the transcripts, and we give the other, other interviewer a truncated file. And within the, the content of that file, we remove anything related to grades. We remove the MCAT scores. Uh, we, we remove the, uh, the letters of recommendation. So what's left is um, you know, the candidate's own perspectives through their personal statement, their own reflections through their supplemental application, and their demographic and biographic experience information. Um, and so that's what our second interviewer will have. So to correlate both of those interviews, it's, it's quite remarkable when you see the correlation because they, they do often match up pretty closely despite the fact that one uh, person is actually not given all the information. And so that's sort of an internal test that we do against our process to make sure that we are reviewing correctly um, it's very, fa and, very fascinating. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, I think it's pretty remarkable. Um, we, we put as, as often as possible, we put our, our candidates into the classroom, into a lecture hall to see a live lecture during the interview day. Uh, we give them tours of the campus here, uh, the hospital. Uh, we have uh, a research center. We have a VA hospital. We have our, um, several clinics and um, obviously the medical school and nursing program um, and our students are the ones providing the tours we have a nice lunch for them uh, again involving our students as participants in that lunch and um, and then there's typically a wrap-up at the end of the day where we um, provide them with a lot of you know necessary information about how to follow up with us about the financial aid process um obviously this year we had to add the choose your medical school tool to that discussion um and um so it's typically about uh from nine o'clock a.m until about 3 p.m 3 30 p.m so full it's a day. long day yeah it's a full day how how can a, a student uh blow an interview in one easy lesson wow <clears throat> I'm sure the well, way, there, there are lots of ways, but what's the easiest way to yeah, blow an interview? Well, the easiest way is not to show up. Okay. That, that's the easiest way. If you, if you don't want to show up for the interview, you could de you'll definitely blow it. Um, okay. So but I would you... encourage anyone who, who does, the, who does uh, receive an invitation to think very carefully about making that, you know, following through with that commitment. You know, it's what's what's really uh, troubling sometimes is to know that you only have a certain number of interview spots, and when one is given up, and often it may be given up at the point where you can't replace nice. the candidate uh, with another candidate uh, in interview. I mean, that's that. Those that's are the true. moments where I'm just like, I I wish I could tell everyone that this candidate did this, but you can't. 
Um, so I would say that's probably the first way to blow it. Um, being late doesn't necessarily blow it, but because we have a very structured interview day, uh, if you're late to it, it's obvious um, and you'll miss information. You might miss something pretty important. Um, so I would encourage being on time or being early. Um, I would say inappropriate comments, inappropriate dress. That's probably third on the list. Um, you know, it, most candidates who come to interview look like they're going to a funeral. They've got the black suit on. <laughs> um, you know, and it's there's feel nothing like it wrong too. with right, yeah. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with adding a little color to your to your wardrobe. Um, I remember uh, I had a candidate come in um, to one interview, not here, but when I was at University of Chicago, and he he wore like a a pink shirt with no with no jacket and like khakis <laughs> and it was just and but just you know but but presented himself in such a way that it didn't matter because he was an outstanding candidate and you know he he ultimately knew it's not about what i wear it's about who i am so i would say if you if you do decide to dress that way just know that you're going to be the outlier and if you can pull it off with your confidence and you can pull it off with your demeanor that's great, but you know if you if you don't have that sort of confidence, um, you need to go out and get yourself a, an interview suit. You know, one unfortunate individual came uh, to interview. Oh boy, there's so many stories I have of wardrobe failures. Um, we had one student who wore a skirt that was too tight, and she she bent over and it ripped. And immediately when that happens, I'm like. My female staff members, I'm like, you need to deal with this. I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> uh, I had one young man come in and clearly he had just bought this suit off the rack because he still had the tags on it and it was oh, way gosh. too big. It hadn't been tailored. Oh, my heart went out to that young man, but he was a great candidate. Again, you know, it doesn't always matter uh, what you wear, it's how you wear it. Um, and then I guess um, general disinterest, falling asleep. Yes. <laughs> because there are moments, yes, there are moments when um, we are in a large group, right? So again, if there's 15 of them or 18 of them, we orient them in the morning. They go through it, like you mentioned, a pretty rigorous day. That's intentional. It's intentional right. to see if you have sure. the stamina to make it through a, a day in class, right? right? So at the end yeah. of the day, when they come back at three o'clock for the orientation, sure enough, especially if it's, you know, in September and it's a little warm outside, there'll be someone who's falling asleep at the end. And I, <laughs> and if I'm doing the end of the end of the day wrap up, I write it down. I, I cause I keep notes. <laughs> I'm like, so-and-so fell asleep. So, you know, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. My, <laughs> You're my... always being watched. Yeah, That's really. The other thing, this, you know? this is not actually an interview story, but, uh, one of my adult sons just left. He was visiting us after attending his sister-in-law's wedding with his wife and, and four kids. And there was, and obviously he was there with the, in a suit. And at one point, his three-year-old was getting into something he shouldn't have gotten into. And the wedding was just about to start. And our son actually had like an official role to play in, in the wedding. And um, he leaned over to keep his three-year-old from doing something that was going to break something and his pants just ripped. Oh, <laughs> and he's, he's a thin, he's a, a very thin guy. He's, right. he's quite thin, but <laughs> come on. Just, and, you know, he's like, what do I, and, I'll, and for some reason he was in, in New York and he calls me and I'm like, what do you want from me? I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> What do you want from me? He says, well, so-and-so lives nearby. A friend lived nearby. Maybe I can borrow some of their pants. I said, you need a tailor. Forget about them. Go find yourself a tailor. <laughs> so he actually, he actually did find himself a tailor and, you know, got it, got them fixed. He comes back and that do, that's what he's supposed to do. They get married. Everything is fine. And he's dancing at the wedding. And all of oh, a sudden his brother-in-law, <laughs> different brother-in-law comes over to him and says, don't move, don't move don't dance like that again. Okay. Just don't do it. Gets home. Pants are completely ripped all over. Again. 
So that, um, yeah, that would definitely be more happen. fun to me. It can happen. It was, it was, he, he was, I mean, it was a really hysterical story, but anyways, okay, let's get back to um, medical school admissions from torn pants at embarrassing places. Um, <laughs> um, let's say somebody is waitlisted or let's better yet, they not even waitlisted. They just don't hear from you. How much, how soon after submitting a secondary should they hear from you? How soon after having an interview should they hear from you? When should they contact you again? When should they? All right. That's a great question. So, so the thing that we don't widely broadcast or disseminate in terms of our information about our process is that we consider updates throughout our process. We really hammer that point home when candidates come and interview because we want them to understand that they have a way to expand the discussion of their candidacy by providing us with academic updates. A lot of candidates are still in programs. They may have grades they want to share. They may have additional advocacy that wants to provide them with um, a letter of recommendation. So we have a mechanism for those things to, ha to happen. Um, Professional updates, obviously, for those who are doing more in the clinical realm or have jobs <clears throat> who have work or in research. Uh, obviously, you know, personal updates, a lot of things can happen personally to an individual. Um, they may need a deferment. They may have a partner that they want to couples match with, which is really not a thing in undergraduate medical school, but a lot of students think that it is. Um, but, you know, there are a myriad of things that need to likely happen to help us understand their situation it, it's a long cycle i mean it starts yeah. in july and it wraps it's up for us here exactly exactly a lot can happen then so we provide a mechanism in our student portal so when our applicants provide their supplemental application they are given a portal and they're given access to that portal and they submit their application through there and they can also upload anything relevant to their application through the portal so they can update freely, you know, and as often as they wish these uh, academic, personal or professional updates. Uh, so that is from the moment they supply the supplemental application into their, into their application. Uh, so a lot of them figure that out. And what they may or may not know is that I, I see those, you know, I see those part of our administrative uh, team efforts are to look at those updates and to, to scrutinize them. Because th the thing, Linda, that's important to understand is that you know when you have this many applications, as I mentioned, interest is a metric. And it's yeah. a metric that we can establish by virtue of, hey, how many times has this candidate uploaded documentation into the portal? How many times has this candidate checked in to the portal? How many times has this candidate called our office you know, um, we always try to make it clear where the candidate is in the process. Whenever they go into the portal, there's a message there that is updated based on their status. So they should always know where they are in the process. Now they may be um, in a certain status for quite some time. Um, yes, we've received your application. Yes, we're reviewing your application. And I think for many, they're frustrated when they don't hear anything else from us. What that could mean is that, hey, you haven't updated us. We're not, you know, we, we interview 5% of our pool. So 95% of those who apply to us are not going to get an interview. So we aren't trying to tell anyone at, the, at any point that they're not viable candidates. But if you don't complete the supplemental by December 13th, you're going to get a rejection letter. Sure. Okay, so that so that jettisons off some part of the pool. If you're still in the pool at that point, about a, about a third of it, based on what you said earlier. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so if you're still in the process at that point, you're still being reviewed. So if you if you know you're in review and you haven't heard anything from us, send us an update. Help us understand why this institution is important for you. Help us understand what's changed about your application. We have an opportunity to provide external recommendations to our committee. So uh, AMCAS standardizes the letter writing upload. Uh, if you are applying through AMCAS, you let AMCAS know exactly how many letters you're gonna provide. 
Uh, we make it pretty clear on our website what our letter requirement is. So you go through the AMCAS process, you have your letters, let's say you're still working, you get a new boss, that boss loves you, wants to advocate for you. Uh, normally that person wouldn't have a mechanism to do that, but we provide it. So tell your boss, hey, you know, I'm applying to medical school at Stretch. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? Uh, and of course, if that happens, that person will call our office, we'll tell them exactly what they need to do to provide that letter. And we will upload it into our system so that we can tie that to the candidate's file. Again, those are things that a candidate should do if they're worried about not being seen, if they're worried about um, whether or not we are giving them the full consideration that they deserve. Ultimately, you can't oversubscribe your interview pool. We can't oversubscribe our class. So we're using a lot of these different metrics within our system to, to shape the class based on those who not only meet the, our desired um, specifications for interest and motivation and service and academic rigor, but who, if given a seat, would take it. I mean, that's sure. at the end of the day, that's, sure. that's what we have to be able to determine. So not that a letter of interest is everything or a letter of intent is everything, but it is something that you consider, whether it's a letter of, of intent or an additional recommendation, relevant recommendation, right. I should add. Absolutely. So the letter of intent, again, when you interview with us, uh, that question often comes up, you know, what, what kind of update can I provide? And, you know, again, the academic, personal, professional update, but a letter of intent would certainly be the highest level of personal update you could provide because that's hopefully giving us some specific reasons why your intention is to uh, to matriculate to us if given a seat. I spoke okay. with a student yesterday as you know we have our our first years orienting this week <clears throat> excuse me and uh one of our orientation activities is that we take them to a baseball game so we we're at the White Sox versus the Mets yesterday and one of our first years comes up to me, sits down next to me at the game, and he says, you may not remember me, but I sent you a lot of updates. And, you know, the, the funny thing is that, like, you know, because there's 170 of them, they, students, individual students, once they get a seat, they, they, feel, they act like you don't know who they are. But that, those are the oh, ones I you really know. do know. <laughs> yes, was, I knew his name, his first and last name, and I was able to... To, to let him know, oh yeah, we got your updates. But you know, he asked he asked the question. He said, "So, how much influence did that have?" And I said, "Well, the fact that I know your first and last name, and I could probably tell you that you, I mean, I could probably tell you, but the number of updates that you provided, uh, it, it it means a lot. You know, it means a lot because at some point, you know, we saw your interest, and we saw your background, and we saw how you did in our process, and we said, you know, this is a candidate that we need to make an offer to. So." It does make a difference. Now, obviously, his concern was, well, I thought that I was doing it too much. You know, I, I don't want you to think that I'm over exuberant. Now, there there is a point where rational exuberance. Yes. And so what I try to help them understand is that, you know, you can update us as often as you wish, but you know, we're reading them. So if you keep telling us the same thing, it's not really helping us understand you better. Now, you can differentiate your updates. You can send one professional update. You can send one academic update. You can send one personal update. You can send several updates, but they should be distinct from one another. Right, right. And I assume they need to show a certain uh, good judgment. Otherwise, they could actually exactly. be negative. Exactly. You're learning, you're learning about the applicant either way, good or bad. I, absolutely, Linda. And professionalism is the name of the game in this particular um, environment of, of, you know, litigation and risk, which we are trying to manage on a day to day basis. You know, we're you don't want to tip your hand to show us anything that you wouldn't want to show a patient or you wouldn't want to present as a part of who you are professionally. So so there there are limits to what are acceptable updates versus unacceptable updates. Do you ever check applicants' social media? Uh, we had that discussion in committee. We've decided not to do that. Um, that That's a conversation that I've had at each institution that I've been a part of. 
Um, <clears throat> it's it's not uncommon though for uh, for some you know even though we don't do it as a process in our committee, it's not uncommon for an individual member of our committee to you know check out some some it, so, so I'll, I'll give you an example there was a wonderful uh person uh, at university of chicago um who um would always would always you know if, if there was a disadvantage statement and there was information about um need because you know students when they write their amcas applications can can articulate this information either through the AMCAS needs test that's part of the demographic and background information, or they can write a disadvantage statement. Without question, he would he would Zillow their their home address, and he would and he would always mention this uh, if he felt like the student was being um, dishonest about this. You know, he'd say, "Well." I can't see how this is a disadvantaged student. They've got a pool in their backyard. And have you seen this house? You know, <laughs> six bedrooms. Well, disingenuous, maybe. Exactly, exactly. So, so this is to say that even though it's not part of a policy, you know, there are humans involved in this work. And I mean, I can't tell every single member of our committee, there's over 200 members of our committee. I can't tell every single one of them not to um, follow their instincts when they when they want to try to you know investigate a little bit further what they see in an application but yeah um but i mean every student should know that and i always tell candidates before they apply to medical school to make yourself invisible on social media as a matter of fact i i didn't realize this but this also applies to fourth year medical students because i i, I make it a, a point not to add any prospective students to my social media platforms whether it be facebook or even linkedin um or i mean no one can find me on twitter fortunately but uh that's my own personal oasis um but but fourth year medical students you know i've noticed a lot of them like their names changing in the fourth year on my facebook feed and so i asked one of them yesterday i said why did you change your name and he said well that's just the advice that our advisors give us as we go into um residency match the mat the match process so that you know we're not going to be uh scrutinized based on our social media platform so again i think that's just a an fyi to anyone out there because you'd never know what individual or what or what medical school is going to have that as a policy to do right. that i think kaplan surveys medical schools every year and it's a significant percentage that does I don't know if it's the schools that check or if it's, I don't remember exactly, or if it's the individual admission staff that say, yeah, they will Google somebody or they'll check Facebook or social media, different social media. Now we've been talking mostly about, you know, the application process itself, which obviously applies mostly to this year's applicants. What advice would you have for applicants interested in applying to Stretch for 2021, for 2020 to 2021, or later application cycles? In other words, not this cycle, mm -hmm. next cycle or later. Right. Well, as I mentioned, you know, we do a lot of that in our work. Um, we counsel prospective students. We have a, a summer program called Aspire. Uh, we have two cohorts that come in where we provide an applicant boot camp. We help them develop their applications, strengthen their applications. Uh, they obviously are candidates we look out for in our own pool, but we impress upon them the importance of, of a broad application so we're hoping that you know they they go to medical school regardless of where um so what i what i tell those candidates is just like what i would say to the candidates you're referring to is um you know if you're if you're looking out into the future of a medical school application you have to make sure that you're taking the right courses that you're providing yourself with the opportunity to represent your academic progress the way that you want it to trend as you go towards medical school, whether you're taking a gap year or not, you need to take the requisite courses and you need to prepare yourself for the MCAT so that you take that course or you take that test when you have completed the core coursework in your program. I also, you know, think it's an important consideration to consider the opportunities you have to get some clinical experience so that you can understand uh, the work environment that you want to be a part of so that you can know that it's the right fit for you. 
Um, for us, I think, you know, it's important to try to develop some inroad into service or leadership among your peers. If you're not in school, to try to sort of cultivate um, some way to provide that in some other fashion, whether it be through work or it be through volunteerism. Um, and, you know, I think that ultimately, you know, if you're preparing the right way, and if you, if you give yourself that amount of time that you really have to look at the landscape of medical schools that you're applying to, know exactly what your application looks like, make sure that nothing is trailing your application so that whenever you do apply, you're applying to the right schools, you, you, you understand their missions, you're going through the MSAR, you're visiting, you're calling those schools, you're getting the right advice to know that you're not wasting an application because, um, you know, it's expensive. Uh, it costs uh, over $300 plus to apply through AMCAS and then every supplemental application is going to cost you at least uh, $80, if not more. Uh, so you have to really know that you're investing in the right opportunity. And again, I think it's a very important thing to not have anything trailing your application. So don't submit your application not knowing what your what your MCAT score is, or don't don't. I mean, again, I, I realize that a lot of students want to apply while they're in program, but I, you know, I really feel like you've got to apply when you have everything in the rearview mirror because that represents a complete body of work. There's nothing left to chance. And you have the ability to to gain the perspective of that experience that you've had in that academic area. So you can talk about and reflect on the entirety of your program as opposed to part of it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. I also think, you know, every so often we, we in particular in, in May, for some reason, I don't know why this particular month is works out that way. We have applicants who contact us. I'm taking the MCAT at the end of May mm -hmm. and I'm preparing for it and I'm not sure I'm going to be ready. Can I still right. apply if I take it in July? Right. And I'm like, right. you know, and, and they're grad, maybe they're graduating or they're still in school and they're, they're like, they're under so much pressure. They're putting themselves under so much pressure. Right. Um, and they're putting themselves at a disadvantage because right. if they took let's say they took the, the uh, MCAT at the end of the summer, they would have had some really good time to, to study. They would have completed the coursework that they need to have to take the MCAT. They would have hopefully had a, more time to study for it, done better on the exam, and then they apply the following June. Ah, but then I lose a year. Right, and, right. Um, I actually was, was interviewing another admissions director, Jennifer Welch, and she said that she likes to, she either heard or, and she prefers to call the gap year a growth year. Mm -hmm. And if, and I, and I think it's a much better term for it. Cause yes, it's not like, I would agree. You know, it's not like there's this gap that you're <clears throat> treading water. You're just kind of getting through it, make it a year of growth, make it a valuable mm -hmm. year. And, um, and then again, you, you, have everything lined up, you're all ready to go, you know what your MCAT is, you know what your GPA is, and then, yes, choose your schools, choose the most most appropriate schools. Um, but I really like like that term much better than gap year. So I agree, um, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, it used to be that students were encouraged not to take uh, a growth year because they would miss out on the momentum right. that they're carrying into medical school, but I, I agree with you that a lot can be gained by taking a step back and reflecting on the past experience, maybe even starting a new one, um, you know, whether it be research or work, because that helps you understand how you gain the perspective you have based on your previous experience. With all that coursework behind you, with all those experiences behind you, now you kind of get a sense for who you are in the real world. And that may be a little bit different than what your expectations were in what I like to call the bubble of undergrad, because we, we understand that undergrad for all its well-intended uh, effects uh, is not exactly a real world example of 
what life is going to be like for you. So right. to, to have that experience going into medical school, I think is very important. Yeah. Is how, how does Loyola um, Stritch look at research? Does it want its students to have research? Is that important to, to Stritch? We believe that academic inquiry is very important. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we want students to be academically prepared. I think one of the best ways to demonstrate that preparation is through research because you're being put into an environment where you're part of a team, you're given responsibilities, you're given tasks that are of an academic nature, you have an opportunity to contribute, you have an opportunity to learn, to advance in understanding of different methods, and to apply those methods within a you know a very truncated amount of time to to a much larger project much larger uh purview of of academia so obviously i think that there are benefits to having research as well if you decide to go into certain professional tracks it's almost incumbent that you have research so if you are going to fully explore all the specialty options available to you as a student going into residency, it is important to consider that if you have research, every door is open. If you don't, not every door is open. So that's an important reason, I think, for research to be part of your background. That doesn't necessarily mean you don't get a shot at uh, medical school if you don't have research, but it certainly will stifle some of your opportunities moving forward if you continue to disregard research going through medical school. Okay. What would you have liked me to ask you that I haven't asked? What would I like for you to ask me? Um, gee, I don't know. You asked me a lot of questions. <laughs> I did. I did. Uh, You've been... <laughs> You're right. I have. Um, well, one of the reasons, I guess one of the questions that I would have maybe liked to have asked, uh, have you had you ask is why I enjoy doing this work. Go um, ahead. So, you know, I, I love admissions. Uh, I've been fortunate to, this is kind of my third career. I started in banking. Uh, I got bored with that. I was a credit investigator for a consumer operations uh, uh, commercial bank in Texas. And then uh, read an article in the local newspaper about a teacher shortage and then decided I wanted to go into teaching. So I taught for 10 years. It's a great experience, one I wouldn't change for anything. But again, at some point, I decided that I needed to do something else. And I didn't know anything about admissions, but I knew my background uh, at that time was going more into the computer information realm and looking at um, you know, how systems might be applied in education. And I felt like there would be, you know, a good opportunity to, to sort of focus that work in admissions because admissions back then was a very paper heavy process. And I, I thought there could be a lot of ways to streamline that. So, but I, I, I was very fortunate to be in an environment working in a secondary school environment and then getting uh, an opportunity to work in medical school environments as an admissions uh, officer. And I just love, I love the energy. I love the enthusiasm. I love the intellect. And I love the, the passion of medical students. Uh, students who wish to go into that profession are unique. They're among the brightest students in the entire world and i and i can say that because i have recruited students from all over the world so um and it, there's a uniqueness to that that speaks to my teaching background that speaks to my um, background in as a student and you know to perpetuate the idea that we're going to improve society which does need to be improved in areas of healthcare. I think we can all agree on yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, to know that there is a future of physicians going into this work that do have that in their midst to improve outcomes, to help people. There's something very gratifying and satisfying about that work. So that's that's one of the things that I really do enjoy about, about doing this. Well, I'm really glad you um, added that, asked the question and answered it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, and and thank you for joining me today. I've enjoyed learning about uh, Stritch School of Medicine and its admissions policies, and I'm sure you've piqued the listeners' interests. Where can they learn more about uh, Stritch School of Medicine? Well, you could uh, look us up on online at luc.edu slash stritch. That's S-T-R-I-T-C-H. Uh, we've got a wonderful website there. You can see all of our different programming elements. You can look at our admissions page, uh, learn a little bit about what it takes to uh, apply and look at the requirements. Um, hopefully uh, that will uh, give you enough opportunity to see that we also have visit days. So if you're in the Chicago area and you're able to visit Stretch and you're interested in applying, feel free to check that box and let us know uh, that you will uh, be visiting us on one of our Stretch visit days. Great. Thank you very much. Listener, you'll find links to uh, the Stritch School of Medicine as well as related resources and podcasts in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 325. I want to also thank you, listener, for joining me today. Quick reminder that you are invited to accept its next webinar, How to Nail Your Medical School Interview. Learn how to prepare for it, answer questions effectively, and nail it. Register for this free event at exhibit.com slash 325 webinar to reserve your seat. Listener, thank you, too, for tuning in to this, our 325th episode. If you found this show worthwhile, subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcaster, or whatever podcaster you prefer. Don't miss anything and subscribe. You can find subscribe links at exhibit.com slash 325. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.